So the format of tonight's uh, talk is Father Spitzer is going to talk for about an hour and 15 minutes and then we're going to open it up for questions afterwards. Um, so have questions in mind as well. Um, but at this time we would like to introduce Father Spitzer. So if you can give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, attending uh, on a perfectly good evening when I'm sure you could have been doing other things besides listening to a bloviator like myself. Um, it's a real honor to be here at WashU and uh, uh, back in my old St. Louis haunt. I, uh, I was a student at SLU a long time ago and, um, and of course, uh, always admired Herbert Spiegelberg and others who are faculty members here at WashU. Um, tonight, I'm just going to be looking at the evidence for God for about an hour and 15 minutes um, from contemporary physics and contemporary universe. Um, I'm going to do this in several uh, kind of little subsections. We're going to first take a look at the, uh, the limits and horizons of science. What can science do? What can't science do? Secondly, we want to take a look at the significance of a beginning uh, in contemporary physics. So just take a look at that um, uh, very important prospect. I just want to give you a, a quick overview of the modern universe and the Big Bang Theory, for not very long, just to give you a sense of the universe. And then we're going to go into three kinds of evidence uh, for a beginning uh, and for uh, uh, intelligence uh, uh, you know, of a creator. And um, the uh, evidence from the beginning will be from uh, space-time geometry proofs, particularly the board of Lincoln and Guth proof, and then the entropy evidence. And then we'll also be looking at the fine-tuning of universal constants and examining the so-called multiverse theory. And so all these things are uh, little prospects that we'll have to uh, discuss along the way, but and then try and draw some conclusions. Uh, I was also asked to uh, throw in some areas of uh, near-death experiences because um, uh, these two uh, are very uh, probative and indicative of uh, uh, transcendence uh, in, our, um, uh, in our midst. And so um, I better get to it, otherwise I'll never finish in an hour and 15 minutes. First of all, what can science do and what can't it do? Uh, essentially, science can't disprove the existence of God. That's not possible. In fact, it's very, very difficult for any rationale to disprove uh, anything. Uh, because, of course, if you wanted to disprove the existence of aliens, um, you would have to examine everything that there was to examine by observational means and notice that aliens weren't there. This is very hard to do. If you want to prove it, the existence of an alien, it's very simple. Find one. But uh, to disprove them altogether, very hard. And God, it gets even worse because scientific methodology is based on observation. And you can't get observational evidence outside of our universe. We're limited to this universe in terms of our observational evidence. And since God transcends our universe, is outside of our universe, it doesn't make any sense at all to say that science can disprove God because science would have to take evidence from within the universe to disprove an entity which exists beyond or outside of our universe and that won't do the trick any more than a cartoon character using evidence from within the cartoon to disprove the cartoonist. It won't work. Number two, statements are frequently made that science now knows enough about the universe, indeed, some say just about everything about the universe, to know that the universe doesn't need a creator. That is an impossible claim. The reason is that science is an inductive discipline. That means it moves from particular observations and then it goes from particular observations to theories, right? So we try and put all those particular observations together and in, into a theory. But there's only one little problem. We never knew and we never know whether we've made every observation we need to make to have a complete theory. Why? Because observational evidence, science, Science cannot know 
what it does not know until it discovers it. <laughs> you don't know whether you've made all the observations necessary for a complete explanation. You never know whether you've made all the, all the observations necessary to have a complete theory. Anybody who tells you otherwise is simply delusional. You don't know this. And so you can't possibly say we know everything or sufficient amount of information about the universe to know that the universe doesn't need a creator. Simply preposterous. It cannot work. It's not a tenable claim in any respect. Third, and this pertains to everything I'm going to say tonight. You know, science has always, because it has to await observations, we all have to be humble here. And the, the point, of course, is that because we don't know whether we've made all the observations, who knows? Everything I say, somebody could discover an exception to the board of a Lincoln. Or maybe we'll find some kind of a, uh, an exception to entropy. Uh, it's going to be rare, and it's going to be really difficult to do these things. But it's possible because, of course, science is an inductive discipline based on observation. So you might say to me, well, Spitzer, if science can't disprove God and it can't even know everything about the universe sufficient to know that the universe doesn't need a creator, how can you be giving us a talk tonight on the evidence for God from contemporary physics? Isn't that kind of not plain fair? And the answer is, actually, there is a reason why you can talk about evidence for God from physics, but not evidence against God from physics. And the reason is, if you can show that the universe has to have a beginning, if you can show from within the universe, so you're taking your evidence from within the universe, you're taking it from observational evidence, you could actually show from that evidence that the universe would have to have a beginning. And maybe even if there were a multiverse out there, and a multiverse would be like a, a gigantic sort of mega universe in which little bubble universes are being burped out and our universe was just one of those little bubble universes, that even a multiverse would have to have a beginning. In fact, that every configuration with an average Hubble expansion greater than zero would have to have a beginning you are coming very close to showing an absolute beginning of physical reality itself. Could I be absolutely certain that I don't, that there's something that not yet discovered, there's no exceptions to this possibility? No. But you can come really, really close to showing an absolute beginning of physical reality. And that, that would be very significant indeed. Because that actually does point to a creator. Let me try and discuss that in just four easy steps. Number one, a beginning in physics, and we're talking about a beginning not just of this universe, but even a beginning of a multiverse, or a beginning of physical reality, okay? a beginning in physics generally marks a point at which um, uh, the universe came into existence. It didn't exist prior to that point. And if it did not exist prior to that point, it was nothing. You might have heard my debate on the Larry King show with, uh, with uh, Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mladenov and Deepak Chopra. Much ado about nothing. Yes, the universe would have been nothing prior to that beginning. And as nothing, prior to that beginning, the only thing it could do is nothing. And if the only thing it could do was nothing, then it could not have moved itself from nothing to something when it was nothing, because the only thing it could have done was nothing. <laughs> and if that's the case, then something else would have had to have moved it from nothing to something. If the physical universe, the physical reality itself were truly nothing, and don't sneak, something is not. <laughs> nothing is not space-time, 
Nothing is not empty space. You can have more or less of empty space because space is dimensional and orientable. But you can't have more or less of nothing because it's nothing. There's nothing to have more or less of. By the way, tunneling from nothing, exactly what does that mean? Tunneling from implies something from which the tunnel proceeds. But you just said it was nothing. And if you really meant it was nothing, then let's just call it what it is, nothing. And furthermore, you get the point. If nothing is truly nothing, and you don't sneak anything into it, then for all intents and purposes, it could never have moved itself from nothing to something when physical reality, when the universe, when the multiverse was nothing, because it could only do nothing and therefore something else which transcends physical reality, something else which transcends a universe or a multiverse or whatever configuration we may want to discuss, would have to have done that. And that transcendent creator seems pretty much like a deity, God. A very basic level of God, but that's what we're dealing with. Now, of course, people recognize that. The reason everybody is trying to sneak something into nothing is because they really don't want the prior state of a beginning to be real nothing. So we're going to have to discuss that in some detail. Because if you really do get to a beginning, you may be looking right at a creator. Let's just pause for a moment and just say, well, what do we think the universe is, is like today? And then get back to that multiverse for just a second. It's a hypothesis. And just see what we can glean from it. First of all, uh, we believe that the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old. That's what we believe. Uh, and there's very good evidence for that, by the way. In fact, it is very rigorously established. Anything really... Oh, it's plus or minus 100 million years. Okay, more or less. Okay. <laughs> And, and you might want to think of the universe, and now this analogy is not by any means perfect, but a, an interesting way to understand it is the, the, uh, uh, by looking at the universe like a balloon. And, and, and the balloon is inflating, okay? And, and just think of space and time as having the capacity to stretch and expand. So in the general theory of relativity, space and time can actually expand. It can stretch, right? So the coordinate system can get bigger and bigger. And like a balloon, if you put black dots on the surface of that balloon, as the balloon is blowing up, what's happening to all the dots? They're moving away from each other. All the dots are moving away from all the other dots. And if you really continue with the analogy for just a moment, those dots were all galaxies, then we would expect that all the galaxies were moving away from all the other galaxies. For all intents and purposes, we think something like that is going on. Except that the universe is not just expanding with a uniform velocity. It's actually accelerating in its expansion. Today, the universe is very likely accelerating in its stretching and growing and pulling these galaxies away from one another. That's pretty much how we kind of view it in a very simplistic way. Obviously, it's not going to be a perfect sphere like a balloon or something of this nature. There could be all kinds of you know, ways of you know, describing it. But let's just say it's in a state of expansion with space-time, especially with space that's capable of expansion. Well, what's the universe made of? It's made of 5% visible matter, 25% roughly dark matter, and 70% dark energy. Visible matter has four forces. It has, well, uh, well, the gravitational force is an exception. Just say it has three forces, and it's immersed in the space-time continuum, which explains gravity and the general theory of relativity. But the key thought is, we have three forces, an electromagnetic force, we have a strong nuclear force binding the protons together in the nucleus of an atom, and we also have the weak force responsible for particle decay and radiation and other important areas. So all these things then are kind of constitutive 
uh, of our universe. Gravitational force is explained by the space-time continuum. And the, uh, right, uh, uh, dark energy, what does it do? It causes the universe to accelerate in its expansion. So just remember when dark energy interacts with the space-time continuum, it causes it to expand and accelerate in its expansion. What does dark matter do? Dark matter is holding together, right? Because matter itself and the density of mass energy is what's causing a collapse of the space-time field. So while the universe itself is expanding and pulling all these galaxies away, the galaxies are not flying apart. And the reason the galaxies are not flying apart is because dark matter and visible matter are holding it together. So 30% of our uh, mass is in these galaxies. Right? We have a black hole in the center of every galaxy and this is causing our galaxies to stay together even though the rest of the universe, the space between the galaxies is flying apart at an accelerated rate. How did we ever come to this theory? A Catholic priest, his name was Father Georges Lemaitre. Um, Father Lemaitre in 1923 published a series of articles I called it the, the, the theory of the primeval atom. Essentially, Lemaitre was trying to explain, uh, by that time, a very well-known problem called the recessional velocities of extragalactic nebulae. Um, what that means in very easy terms is that there are light sources out there which we now know to be, uh, today to be other galaxies. And those galaxies, what they notice, those, those other light sources, they're just moving away far too quickly to be explained by a, an ordinary theory of galaxies moving in, in already pre-existent space. And, and so what we notice then is that uh, there has to be some other kind of explanation for it. And Father Lemaitre was the one who discovered that explanation. Uh, what he thought of was perhaps the universe was like this balloon. And instead of the galaxies moving away from each other in pre-existent space, he thought to himself, well, perhaps space was growing and stretching, causing the galaxies to move away from each other. And he came up with a constant and an equation which explained it. But let me try and explain it for a moment, because when I get to this board of Lincoln and Guth proof, I'm going to try and not bore you with it, but I'm going to try and hold you in there. But just imagine you have a ruler here, and you've got a rubber band. And put a dot on zero, a dot on one, and a dot on two. Now take your thumb and put it on the dot on two, and stretch it all the way to four. You guys with me? So the dot that was on two is now in, at four, and how many inches did it grow? Two. But where did the dot that was on one go to? only to two. It only grew one inch when the further galaxy went two inches. And this is precisely the problem because what they noticed is the further away the galaxy was, the more the recessional velocity of that galaxy away from us. So what Lemaitre postulates is, I've got an explanation. Let's suppose that space is like that rubber band. Let's suppose for a moment that really it's the expansion of the rubber band that's causing the dots to move. It's the expansion of space that's causing the dots to move. Well, if there's twice as much rubber band from zero to two as from zero to one, what would we expect to happen? There would be twice as much expansion because there was twice as much space to expand, which would mean that the recessional velocity should be double. And he comes up with a constant. It's called the Lemaitre constant. Today, it's now the Hubble constant. He presents his findings to Einstein. And Einstein looks at it and says, Nice going, lad. The mathematics is perfect. <laughs> but the physical theory is preposterous. And he sent him packing. Until Edwin Hubble came and did a survey of the heavens and discovered in 1927 at Mount Wilson, with Einstein standing next to him after the survey was completed, that everything in the universe was redshifting. That means everything's moving away from everything else. And furthermore, precisely according to the, the, the ratios and the constant that Lemaitre had given. Of course, Hubble had much better observations than Lemaitre did. 
because he was there at Mount Wilson, best telescope in the world at that time. And of course, it soon became the Hubble constant. And today, we have the very same equation. Recessional velocity equals the Hubble constant times the distance from the observer. That still stands. Lemaitre's theory looked like it was very tenable. And then came Dr. Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. And they discovered a 2.7 degree Kelvin uniformly distributed radiation. And of course, they later, the only way you're going to get a uniformly distributed radiation in the universe is with a cosmic event. It has to be right at the beginning of the expansion or very, very close to the beginning of the expansion in order for everything to be completely or almost completely uniform. It's not completely uniform, but it's really close to completely uniform. And of course, we now know that as the residual radiation from the Big Bang, and uh, it's, it, we're bathed in it right now, the entire universe is bathed in it at 2.7 degrees Kelvin, but it, there's a microwave frequency that corresponds to that, and that pretty much did it. We today now, because of the WMAP satellite, the Wilkinson a microwave anisotropy probe, and of course the COBE satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, one and two, and now the uh, Planck satellite, we pretty much know that Big Bang Theory is really rigorously uh, verified. And the Catholic priest, not bad for a guy who's just a man of faith. Did go to MIT, though, and get a doctorate. So, <laughs> but the long and the short of it is, today, we really do have a considerable amount of evidence for the Big Bang. And that presents us with a question. Was the Big Bang the beginning of the physical universe? Or was there something prior to the Big Bang? Now, of course, because of quantum cosmology, quantum cosmology is when you put together the gravitational force with the other three forces we just saw, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, and the weak force, if you put them all together, and that's a very difficult thing to do, but if you put them together in a quantum cosmological configuration, you could actually theoretically have a period prior to the Big Bang. And um, that's a very interesting prospect. String theory uh, is one of the most well-known quantum cosmologies today, uh, where you have basically an 11-dimensional configuration Right, M theory is what it's called, 10, ten uh, dimensions plus time, right? And uh, these are uh, one dimensional uh, vibrating fibers or, um, you know, uh, strings. A and uh, uh, they can explain every particle and every particle spin. You can actually uh, uh, show that. Uh, the problem is there's no evidence for string theory as yet. Uh, and um, we're having a very, very difficult time even finding. Uh, some methods of verifying uh, string theory. So um, I, I know some of my friends who are stringers are in panic a little bit, but uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, it's still there. It's still a very plausible, beautiful uh, uh, theory, extremely complex. Uh, quite frankly, the, the mathematics is beyond me to, to take God to figure it out half the time. <laughs> but uh, but um, the long and the short of it is, uh, that's one theory. There's loop quantum gravity, right? Lee Smolin and his, and his group, you know, uh, prefer a different kind of uh, quantum cosmology and so forth. So there are many quantum cosmologies. So what does that mean? Yeah, a period prior to the Big Bang may have been a reality and may have been a possibility. Hold on to that for just a moment. So one thing is, this universe alone had a quantum cosmological period that extended back for quite a, a long time. Okay. There's a second uh, pre-Big Bang scenario, and that's the one we just saw. That's the multiverse theory. The multiverse, right, that's that big kind of mega universe that's burping out all those little bubble universes. Our universe is one bubble universe amidst those uh, bubble universes, right, and, um, among many others. And perhaps there's trillions and trillions and trillions of bubble universes. So maybe that uh, exists. So maybe our universe had a beginning in the Big Bang, but of course, we're just one universe in this much bigger configuration, the multiverse. Uh, again, we have a little problem. Um, there is uh, no evidence for a multiverse, and it would be really difficult to get it because it's beyond our event horizon. Essentially, it's outside of our universe. So verifying a multiverse is really going to be tough. 
It's almost a metaphysical, a beyond physics theory. But nevertheless, tenable, and it's possible that it's a physical entity that's out there. Okay? Remember this, though. Every multiverse must be inflationary. This will become important later. Every multiverse must be inflationary. Are you hanging in there? There's a third possibility. And the third possibility is that there's an oscillating universe, a bouncing universe, expanding and contracting and co expanding and contracting. And so our Big Bang was just the beginning of a cycle, right, a bounce, but there might have been all these previous cycles prior to our bounce, prior to our Big Bang, and maybe there were an infinite number of those things. So each one of these configurations is a possibility for extending the time of physical reality before the Big Bang. All of them, could they be infinite back in time? Could we avoid the beginning of the physical universe by postulating these things? And what I'm going to submit to you is, no. Every one of these configurations will itself have to have a beginning. And there's actually some rather substantive evidence for that which leads us to that whole thing of if prior to the beginning there was really physical reality was really nothing and the only thing nothing can do is nothing then something else is going to have to move the universe from nothing to something when it's nothing because the only thing it could do is nothing and for all intents and purposes you're right back at that transcendent creator again so we better take a look at some of the evidence that, that exists for it so let's go to the first thing I'm going to call it space-time geometry proofs can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try and put this, put this little thing up a little bit. Uh, the uh, space-time geometry proofs, you know, uh, are dynamic proofs. Some of them are called singularity theorems. So they prove that uh, space and time have to come to a beginning. They, they originate at a particular point. And, and some of those singularity, uh, some of those theories are not singularity theorems. We'll just call them uh, past time. Um, uh, incomplete theories. So the incompleteness of past time, that is to say, all, uh, can't extend it back ad infinitum. It has to have a beginning. Let's just take a look at uh, three instances of some space-time geometry proofs. By the way, there were some original ones by Hawking and Ellis and Hawking and Penrose uh, that were the original singularity theorems. Unfortunately, those theorems did not account for the possibility of universal inflation. Most physicists today do believe in an inflationary theorem, a theory, but uh, Roger Penrose and some other ones are trying to refute it. But for all intents and purposes, I'd say the, that most people would hold that inflation is a reality because it explains a lot of things that the standard Big Bang model cannot explain. But hold on to that for just a moment. The one thing we just want to say is we want to get these space-time geometry proofs from after 1993. So we want to make sure it's after inflationary theory. Uh, Dr. Alan Guth, right, who's the father of inflationary theory, put these things together. So we want a proof that's after 1993. One of them comes from Arvin Borda and Alexander Vilenkin. Um, uh, Arvin Borda uh, used to be at the Kavli Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, I think he's now retired from there. Uh, but at the time, he was at the Kavli Institute. And then uh, Dr. Alexander Vilenkin, who's the director of the Institute of Cosmology at Tufts University in Boston. And uh, these two uh, got together, and they created a post-inflationary space-time geometry proof that had four conditions. Now, I'm not going to go through the four conditions tonight, but, of course, if you want to read about them, chapter one of this fine book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, we'll give them to you. But it had four conditions, and if those four conditions were met, then it would require that the universe, or even an inflationary multiverse, would have to have a beginning. So very powerful proof. 1997, they discovered an exception to it called the weak energy uh, exception. So the third condition of that proof out of the four conditions was called the weak energy uh, principle, and they did discover an exception uh, that was very, 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 very remote. But nevertheless, it was an exception. And so the proof was not cast in, in, in stone, but it was a very, still very powerful proof. And, and Dr. Alan Guth uh, came out in 1999. He was the one who was the father of inflationary theory. 
right, uh, Alan Guth came out and said essentially, look, the possibility that this exception would actually hold for our universe or other inflating universes, you know, is so remote that I consider it to be unimportant. So even Guth held to the validity of the Board of Lincoln uh, 1993 proof and still does so today. Uh, so that's still a, it's still a very good proof for a beginning of our universe or other inflating universes or multiverses. Uh, and it's a singularity theorem, it's a singularity proof. So it resolves back to a single point. Then in 1999, uh, this fellow, Dr. Alan Guth, uh, who, by the way, holds the high chair of cosmology at, at MIT, um, and as I said, a very important physicist. He also has, you know, father of inflationary theory and other important theories uh, in the contemporary Big Bang model. So he's a very, very important physicist. Uh, Guth actually tried to do modeling of inflationary universes, taking everything that we know about uh, currently about inflationary model universes or even a multiverse, and he tried to show you know, that, that some of these would um, uh, escape the need for a beginning. But in 1999, he just plain gave up. And he made this declaration in the, in the uh, uh, physical review letters, D. He basically said, as far as I can tell, after having looked at every known model of inflationary universes, every single one of them requires a beginning. They can be eternal into the future, but not into the past. They all require a beginning. So that kind of shook people up. And of course, in 2003, not surprisingly, guess who gets together? Arvind Borda, Alexander Vilenkin, and Alan Guth. And they develop a proof in 2003, not surprisingly, called the Borda Vilenkin and Guth proof or the so-called BVG proof or BVG theorem. This proof is a very important proof because unlike the Board of Lincoln proof in 1993, which had four conditions, this proof only has one. It's not a singularity theorem, so it doesn't resolve it back to a definitive beginning at a particular point. What it does do, though, is it proves that every universe, every multiverse, even universes in the higher dimensional space of string theory, even bouncing universes in the higher dimensional space of string theory. So we have colliding three-dimensional membranes, you know, uh, with a, uh, inside a four-dimensional bulk space-time. And every time a collision takes place, it releases energy into those two three-dimensional membranes in the higher dimensional space of string theory and burps out new universes. So like a bouncing universe on steroids. So you can, you can basically see that uh, this possibility, right, all these things that have been, uh, you know, the, the, this one proof, it, it all shows that every one of these configurations has to have a beginning because this proof does not require anything other than an average expansion rate of the universe as a whole be greater than zero no matter how small. So the only condition that needs to be met is that the average expansion rate of the universe or the multiverse, and the multiverse has to have an average expansion rate greater than zero because it has to be inflationary. It's the only way you can get, get a, a multiverse. So essentially, that's the only condition, and it doesn't really matter beyond that one condition what the physics of the universe is. Even Vilenkin says, it really doesn't matter if you disprove all of, gravitational, all of Einstein's gravitational theories. It doesn't matter. Because the only thing that does matter is that the average expansion rate be greater than zero. Would you be up for a five-minute logical explanation of this proof? Or are you okay with just going for it? Now, you can, by the way, if you want the mathematical explanation, go to that website, modjustreasonandfaith.org. Just go to that and just click on other resources, and you will see Alexander Vilenkin's lecture at uh, Cambridge University during, frankly, the birthday party of Stephen Hawking. More on that later. But uh, uh, proving the beginning of the universe, I know. Uh, you know, Lisa Grossman in the New York Times called it the worst birthday present ever. <laughs> <laughs> but the long and the short of it is, uh, uh, Lincoln is, uh, essentially uh, says, you know, it doesn't really matter what the physics of the universe is. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we have to have uh, a, a beginning. 
So let's take a look at this five-step argument very, very quickly. Remember what I was saying about Father George Lemaitre? Let's call the first premise of the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof Lemaitre's theorem. Okay? So the way you get the universe to have recessional velocities being greater with the distance from the observer is like that rubber band. Okay? So remember, as we move further and further away, the recessional velocities get greater and greater because there's twice as much rubber band to expand. Right? So you keep the, And if you had one that was three times further away, you'd have three times the recessional velocity because there's three times more space to stretch and expand. Three times more rubber band to stretch and expand. Remember, the galaxies are not moving away in pre-fixed in pre, uh, space. They're, the space is expanding and moving the galaxies away from one another. So twice as much rubber band, twice as much recessional velocity. Three times as much rubber band, three times as much recessional velocity. So that's all you have to remember for the very first premise. The further away something is, the greater its recessional velocity will be because the space between them is greater and that's more space to expand and that means there's going to be more um, uh, expansion, more recessional velocity. So far so good? You, you okay? Number two. I'm going to, just a new concept, just to throw you off, and that's called relative velocity. Relative velocity just simply means the velocity of a projectile relative to an observer. Okay? So, for example, let's suppose we have a rocket ship, a projectile, and it whizzes past our galaxy at 100,000 miles per hour. Now, let's suppose you have two distant galaxies out there, uh, and uh, one of them is, um, uh, let's just say, a unit of one away from us, and the second one is a unit of two away, so it's further away from us. Okay? Let's suppose that the one that's closer to us is moving at 25,000 miles per hour away from us, the recessional velocity, because of the expansion of space. What do you suppose would be the approximate velocity of the one that was two units away from us? 50,000 miles per hour. Exactly. So it would be moving twice as fast away from us. More or less, roughly. Right? That's obviously, there's, I'm being simplified here. Okay. Now, Let's suppose there are observers on both those distant galaxies. Remember, our rocket ship whizzed past us at 100,000 miles per hour. The observers on the first galaxy, moving at 25,000 miles away from, um, from the rocket ship, uh, per hour away from the rocket ship, would see the rocket ship moving at what velocity? 100,000 is the velocity of the rocket, minus... 25, which is because it's moving away from the rocket, so it's, it's receding backwards while the rocket's trying to catch up to it. So it has to be, the, the observers would see the rocket coming at 75,000 miles per hour. But the observers on the more distant galaxy would see the rocket coming at 50,000 miles per hour. So 100,000 minus 50,000 recessional velocity equals a relative velocity of 50,000. You still hanging in there a little bit? A little bit? Okay, now that's the case, then think that recessional velocities and relative velocities kind of go in the opposite direction. As the recessional velocity gets greater and greater, what's happening to the relative velocity? It's getting smaller and smaller. That's right. Are you still hanging in there? Step number, th sort of? Step number three. It doesn't just apply to distance. It also applies to time. What Board of Lincoln and Guth noticed is, as we go out into the future of our expanding universe, are you with me? There's going to be more space. Now, if there's more space in the future than there was in the past, then what would happen to the recessional velocities? Remember, more space to expand, more recessional velocity. What would we expect recessional velocities of galaxies to be doing as we go into the future? They would be getting greater and greater because there's more space to expand. 
You still with me? But what would be happening to the relative velocities as we go into the future? Smaller and smaller. Because the relative velocity is always going to decrease when the recessional velocity is increasing. Can you stand two more steps? Okay. Okay. Here's the fifth step. If the recession, I'm sorry, if the relative velocities of all the projectiles in the universe are getting smaller and smaller, less and less into the future, what were they doing in the past? Those, re, those relative velocities must have been greater and greater in the past, right? And the further back in time we go, the faster that relative velocity has to be. Are you still are you hanging in with me? So the more we go back into the past, the greater the relative velocity is going to be. Until we hit a number. 186,200 miles per second. 300,000 kilometers per second, which is what? The speed of light. The highest possible velocity for energy to achieve in our universe. Once every projectile in our universe is traveling at the speed of light, you with me? Or actually, they're not going to reach the speed of light. But once it's traveling and it's arbitrarily close to the speed of light, you will not be able to go one microsecond before that. You are talking about a beginning. Now, somebody could say, hey, Spencer, scientists are going to soon discover a tachyon. And a tachyon is a particle which travels faster than the speed of light. Or they're going to tra- find some other form of energy that can travel faster than the speed of light. Does this affect the Board of Lincoln and Goose Proof at all? No. It just means it's going to take, you're going to have to go back into the past a little bit more to reach that particular velocity and get another one. You know, this is going to be the tachyon squared. Okay, go back into the past a little bit more. But eventually, every single time you reach that maximum possible velocity, even if it's not the speed of light, even if it's twice as fast as the speed of light, what are you going to, what's going to happen? You're always going to have to reach a boundary to pass time. That's what they're saying. Now, you might say to yourself, oh, wait a minute, why does there have to be a finite uh, um, speed, um, a maximum possible velocity, which is a finite speed. Why can't energy just travel at an infinite velocity? That's bad. Because every time you have energy traveling at an infinite velocity, then it's everywhere in every place of the universe simultaneously. This has the curious effect of multiplying matter right out of the first Uh, law of thermodynamics. But it even has another really bad effect. If I've got a bunch of protons and they all occupy every single space in our universe simultaneously, and now I've got electrons and they too can, I'm just theoretically saying they can go at an infinite velocity, and they're everywhere simultaneously, then at every single point in our universe you have proton electrons. That's a contradiction. You've got a sheer proliferation of matter that's unexplained by the first law of thermodynamics, and on top of it, the universe is filled with contradictions. Yike! What can you do? Nothing except exceed to the finite velocity, uh, maximum velocity of of, of energy in the universe. That's different than quantum information. We're talking about energy, which contradicts energy which has to pro- proliferate. We're not talking about information. We're talking about energy. For all intents and purposes, this is going to be one darn difficult uh, proof to, to find an exception to. Because any time you have a universe, any time you have a multiverse, any time you have a universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory, you're going to have to have a beginning if only one condition is met, at the average rate of expansion of that universe or multiverse or that universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory, right, is greater than zero, you're going to have to have a beginning. 
Very difficult to get out of this. At one point, Alexander Vilenkin in 2006 declared it this way. He said, you know, a good argument will convince a reasonable man and the proof will convince even an unreasonable one. Well, now that the proof is in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind even the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They must confront the reality of a beginning. Stephen Hawking wrote a book called The Grand Design, and he forgot to mention this proof. So Vilenkin went to his birthday party in 2012 and read that paper on why physicists can't avoid a creation. And on the sheets you have that have the bibliography on them, there's a little summary of that by Lisa Grossman, uh, who is writing for the New Scientist. She's also with the New York Times. And you can see that uh, paper and uh, the, the worst birthday present ever. So, but um, I want to just entertain one other thought. There is that possibility that the universe could have been in a static condition. So in other words, we're not talking about a multiverse. Multiverse has to be inflationary. We're not talking about an oscillating universe. And an oscillating universe is going to have to have an average um, rate of expansion greater than zero. Right? And, and so um, it, you're, all these configurations already fall under the board of Vilenkin and Guth proof. So there's only one way you're really going to get out of the BVG proof. And that is if you have a static universe that goes back in time, right? Uh, presumably infinitely. And then one day it explodes into the Big Bang. Now, there's a lot of good mathematical reasons for this, and Alexander Vilenkin is talking about it in this very lecture uh, that you have the summary of from Lisa Grossman on the back of your sheets. However, there's a logical problem too, and it needs to be taken very seriously. If you have a, a condition which remains perfectly stable for an infinite amount of time, and that's what you're going to have to have. You're, if you're going to have an infinite uh, condition, right, you can't have a metastable condition. It's going to have to be a perfectly stable condition to last for an infinite amount of time. Otherwise, it will begin to devolve. Now, here's the problem. If you had a perfectly stable condition to guarantee that it would last for an infinite amount of time without breaking down, and then you say one day it exploded, no, it didn't. No, 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 no. Because if it exploded, that's in a metastable condition. That had to have something in it that would kind of decay or change or do something that would cause the universe to move out of the perfectly stable condition, which it couldn't have been, out of the metastable condition into a new condition. You can't have it both ways. Either the universe is perfectly stable or it's metastable. But it's not both. If it's perfectly stable, it's not metastable. If it's metastable, it's not perfectly stable. You can't have infinite amount of time and then boom. You can't have it both ways. Remember the old definitions of the inf infinitesimal? It's infinitely small, but it's greater than zero. No, it's not. If it's infinitely small, then you can multiply it by itself an infinite number of times and it will still be infinitely small. But if it's greater than zero, if you multiply it by itself an infinite amount of times, you know what it is? It's infinite. <laughs> it's either infinitely small or it's infinitely large, but it's not both. You can't have your cake and eat it too. We have to be respectful of basic principles of non-contradiction and logic. For this reason, I do think it's fair to say that it's reasonable and responsible and probative to believe that the universe or a multiverse or a static quantum cosmological configured universe or uh, an oscillating universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory must all have a beginning. As Vilenkin says, there are no shortage of attempts to try and disprove this. All kinds of ways of doing it. But up to this point, I have discovered nothing 
that resembles a success. Could there be a discovery made? Possibly. Because science is inductive. There may be something we don't know. But I do know one thing, that the attempts to get outside of the BVG proof and the problem with the, the, the um, a perfectly stable universe being metastable, these configurations are really bizarre. I mean, you've got to... You've got to go back to strange configurations of De Sitter space, and then you have to have time going backwards in one of the dimensions of De Sitter space. Right? And it's just getting to the point where it requires so much more faith not to believe in God than to believe in God. <laughs> honestly. I mean, they are truly bizarre configurations. And so, I, honestly, I, I don't know, you know how people can say these are reasonable options. They, they don't look physically realistic to me, and to a lot of my friends, I'll tell you, they just don't look physically realistic. And that's why this Board of Lincoln Goof Proof looks somewhat probative, um, and it doesn't mean it's going to be permanently probative, but for the moment, looks like we may have had a beginning of physical reality. Just saying. Number two, entropy. By the way, did I waste time going through those five steps? Are you kind of interested? Okay, all right. Let's go through entropy, and I'm going to try and do this logically, too, in, in five steps, if, if you don't mind. And, and, and again, you can get all the math stuff. Just go to the website, go to the Lincoln lectures, or go to the entropy lectures, right? And you can get all the math stuff later. Okay. Right now, logically, just think of the following five steps. Entropy def definition is a measure of disorder or disorganization within a physical system. You need, essentially order within a physical system in order to have some disequilibriums in that system. You need really ordered, uh, organized, uh, you know, uh, uh, configuration.